Welcome to the FPNA Trends webinar, the winning formula for FPNA storytelling. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening around the globe. I'm so excited to say we have 473 registrants from 54 countries around the world. Truly a global thought leadership program. I'm really excited about this topic because I think this is my favorite topic and I think it's a game changing skill for FPNA. Storytelling, in my opinion, can be the skill that takes us to the next level. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about why is storytelling a game changing skill for FPNA? We're going to talk about why is it so important? We're going to demystify everything about dashboards. I'm so excited about that particular section. We're going to talk about persuading through stories. Right? It's about using logic and emotion and really excited about that. We'll have some conclusions and recommendations and a Q&A session. So really encourage everybody to ask questions via the chat, sorry, via the question section. And what we will do is we'll commit to answering every single question, even the ones we don't get to on this webinar via email. I'm so excited to introduce my panel. If you wouldn't mind joining me on camera. Welcome everybody. So I'm going to start with Deepak Bandari, who's based in Oakville, Canada. He's a strategic finance leader, currently the VP of FPNA and strategy at Highlander Foods in Toronto, and has 20 years of phenomenal experience and is a great storyteller. Stellar. Welcome, Deepak. Okay, next I'm going to go to Jürgen Feist in Hilden, Germany, the co-author of a game-changing book, Solid Outline Hatched. He's an experienced C-level manager, and myself and him have actually spoken at previous webinars, has fantastic thought leadership. Welcome, Jürgen. Hi, Ron. Glad to be here. Fantastic. And last but not least, I have Taylor Ostot. He's based in Arizona in the United States. He has tremendous passion for building high-performance teams and has fantastic experience at leading organizations. He's gonna talk a lot about using logic plus emotion. Welcome, Taylor. Thank you, great to be here. Okay, fantastic. So I'm looking forward to bringing my panel back. I'm gonna have some introductory words and then I'll invite them back onto the screen. Okay, really wanna thank our sponsor for today, ThinkSell. Create and, create and edit beautiful charts and slides in minutes. Okay, I'm always really, really impressed with this slide. So cl clearly a global thought leading community. L Larissa Melnichuk and her amazing team, Mariana, who's my partner on this webinar, 29 cities, 16 countries, four continents. What a fantastic community. In the middle of the page, you'll see FPNA Insights. So best practice webinars, a huge LinkedIn, LinkedIn group for thought leadership, and FPNA Trends Digest, which is really around sharing cutting edge research and articles around the globe. On the right side of the page, you'll see FPNA Education, Research, and Consulting. So, best practice workshops, consultancy, artificial intelligence, and machine learning FPNA commi committees. And what has been super helpful is the current surveys. So, the 2022, the 2023 surveys to really understand what is at the cutting edge of FPNA. And how can we use that to our advantage? A little bit of housekeeping. So we're going to have a one hour webinar. We're going to have two polls and really encourage you to vote on the poll when I launch it. We'll have a Q&A uh, session and the presentation handouts will be available. You will get a recording and the presentation after the meeting. So really, really want to share in this thought leadership and really encourage you to complete the survey. This is all about how do we make these webinars as value added as possible for every single person on the call. Okay, so before I get to my amazing panel, I spent almost 20 years in FPNA and really am passionate about this particular topic. Whenever I talk, think about stories, I think about back in the days of fires, right? What was the way the human race actually communicated stories? It was around sitting around a fire and sharing stories among the team. And so how does that extend to the business community? When you think about FPNA, we have a 360 degree view of the business. We have all this data, all this amazing insight at our fingertips. 
But when we're able to cultivate the ability to tell a fantastic story in a business context, you get number one, a quick understanding and common understanding with every single member of the virtual or in-person team. You then get to what's the interesting content that I include in my stories that really captures attention and leads to business discussions that are value added. And most importantly, number three, which is how do we drive business action, right? With our 360 degree view of the business, it's around driving action that's gonna help the business move forward. As I think about that a little bit more, there's a fantastic white paper that's gonna be sent out to all participants, all registrants in this webinar in the next couple of days. And that really defines a storytelling formula. So it's around number one, define your audience, really understand who you're talking to. The second piece is around crafting the story and really taking the time to first understand that audience and then craft the story. How do you then add a lot of credibility? And that's where we have a massive strength in FPNA, right? We see the whole business, we see 360 degree, degree view of the business. We can use really use a fact-based approach. And last but not least, one of the biggest elements of a great story is passion and energy. Right? So in addition to having the facts and the ability to understand the, the data, then it's like, how do you bring the passion and energy, which again, coming back to where I started, the only way to really capture an audience, especially in this time of digital distraction, is through an effective and passionate story. So I love the fact that we've now cultivated it and brought it into a, form, uh, a formula for FPNA storytelling. And building on that, as you think about it, a story is really part art, part science, right? I think about the science being the data, the facts, the knowledge, the art becomes really all the other elements that surround it to bring a great story to life. So number one, understand your business value drivers, right? The more you understand your business, you, you know, your all elements, the 360 degree view of the business, the better. Visualization, right? We all know the term a picture's worth a thousand words. The visuals are much easier to understand for cross-functional audiences and they get to a quick and common understanding. Learning from others. One of the things I always did, I said, who is the best presenter, best storyteller, and what are the things I can learn from them? And just like anything else, I really believe every single FPNA individual can be a great storyteller if they practice, right? And we've got three fantastic panelists who will do that. Uh, and I'm now going to actually call on Deepak Bandari, who is going to share his particular formula for storytelling. Deepak, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ron. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the audience today. Uh, excited to share a little bit about my personal journey around uh, my winning formula for telling a uh, financial story. So first, I'd like to begin with why presentation or why the, you know, the financial storytelling is so important and why it's such a critical skill set uh, for FP&A professionals to learn. So, as many of you know, when you're an FPNA, a key component of our roles is to drive the right insights and the right analytics to drive the business forward. Now, in today's world, we've got access to a tremendous amount of data, right? Both internal and external data. And this is why storytelling is so critical, because it allows us to take all that data, focus on the key insights, translate that into a cohesive story, and ultimately gain that cross functional alignment better decision making and drive action within the organization. Now, I can recall, you know, early in my career when I learned this, this, this very valuable lesson around storytelling. And it was a time early in my career where I was presenting month end results and I jumped right into the details uh, of the numbers, no real context, no real story, and certainly uh, didn't focus on any key insights. And at the end of the day, didn't drive any decisions and certainly didn't drive action within the organization. And so for me, that's why financial storytelling is so critical for, for FPNA professionals to learn because it allows us to enable that decision-making process and ultimately drive uh, you know, collaboration and the business forward. So with that, I'd just like to then introduce, I guess, my winning formula for telling a financial story. So it is a, uh, it's a very simple framework that basically takes all of that data and synthesizes it into the what, the so what, and the now what. Basically, what's the issue, what does it mean to the business, and what are we gonna do about it? Now, underpinning this framework are two critical enablers for success. 
Number one, you got to know your details, right? It's very hard to tell a financial story if you don't understand the details that underpin it. And number two, you need to translate the numbers into a business action or an event. It's really important to remember that at the end of the day, the numbers are simply an output of a business action or an event. So your ability to talk in terms of a business action or a business event and communicate that to your audience will greatly improve your storytelling and allow for that cross-functional collaboration and that business action that you want to drive. So with that, I'd just like to spend a few minutes, few minutes going through each element of the framework. So the what. The what is all about setting the appropriate context or background to your storytelling. It really helps drive the objective and the theme of the story that you want to tell. This is where understanding the details is so important because it allows you to synthesize all those details into clear and concise facts that will support the story you want to tell. So if we use this as an, in an example, and, and I chose inflation as an example because I'm sure many of you on the call today uh, have, have all experienced inflationary pressures within your respective businesses. Now, one way to tell that story is to simply jump into the numbers and talk about the cost increases that are impacting your businesses. The other way is to really talk about the what or the background as to why costs are rising. So talk a bit about in terms of the market factors. That could look something like this. There are geopolitical factors or tensions that are driving the cost of grain and the fuel up. Uh, there are supply demand imbalances caused by COVID that could be causing ocean freight costs to rise. There are labor shortages uh, in certain markets that are causing wage rates to rise. All of these, as you can see, are critical factors and important background that helps your audience understand the magnitude of the problem and the factors or the why behind the numbers that are increasing. And once your audience understands that important background, you can now lead them into, well, what does that mean to their businesses? And that takes me to the next element of the framework, which is the so what. The so what is all about translating that background or context, i.e. the what, in terms of what does it mean to the business? This is where you focus on insights that really make it real for your business partners, right? Because once the business partners make, you know, understand the impact to their respective areas, you can then lead them down the path of action to, to address it. So again, leveraging that inflation example that we talked about, the, the what talked about the market forces that were driving costs to increase, the so what would translate that market uh, forces into the impact on your business. What's the cost increases on, on certain products and by how much? What's the cost impact on customers and how much? What's the cost impact on countries and how much? The point is, is you're now making that data real to the audience that you want to communicate to. And when you supplement that with the background as to why it happened, you can now lead them to what are we going to do about it? Which brings me to the last element of the framework or the now what. And the now what is where it all comes together, right? As the quote says, action is the foundational key to all success. This is where FP&A has the opportunity to provide their recommendations and their input in terms of influencing the business to drive action, right? So if done correctly, we would have told the story with the what, the so, you know, the what being the market factors that are impacting, uh, impacting uh, costs, the so what, how does that cost translate into your business? And the now what is what would we recommend doing to solution it? In the case of inflation, it could be, are we gonna recommend pricing? Are we going to recommend promotional uh, changes, uh, spend changes? Are we going to recommend working with our supply chain partners to, uh, to try to mitigate the cost of inflation? Or all of the above, depending on your unique situation. I think the key at the end of the day, as you're going through this framework, is you want to set the appropriate context, provide the impact to the business, and provide the recommendations in such a way that you drive that cross-functional collaboration, enable better business decisions, and ultimately drive action within your organization. Now, that kind of concludes the, the basis of the framework. I'd like to just end my presentation with a few tips that I use in terms of putting a presentation together. And so there are several tips that I'll just quickly walk the, uh, walk the, the, the folks through. So number one, take the time to understand the story you want to convey, okay? Uh, this is after you've done your detailed analysis, it's very helpful to take a step back kind of look at the forest from the trees and really try to think through the messaging that you want to give to your audience. Two, 
tailor your story to your audience, right? Different audiences require different levels of detail. And so it's so, so important to keep that in the back of your mind. Number three, uh, each slide should have an insight that supports the story. All too often I see finance presentations with a bunch of numbers on, on the presentation slides, but there's no real insight there that's called out. The insight exists, but it's left up to the audience to figure it out. So I think it's super important to make sure that you call out the insight on each slide that helps support the story you want to tell. Number four, use data visualization. Uh, Ron mentioned that earlier in, in his presentation, and there's great tools out there like ThinkCell that help enable you know, data visualization in a very clean, simple way. And five, six, and seven is leveraging the framework we just discussed. So always provide that appropriate background and context, which is the what, synthesize the message into a clear and concise points, articulating the impact of the business, which is the so what, and ultimately provide your recommendations that gain that cross-function alignment and drive the business forward, which is the now what. So that concludes my presentation. Just want to say thank you again, Ron, for the opportunity to share a little bit about my journey, and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, Deepak, that was fantastic. And I love the simplicity of the what the so what and then now we're oh, now what it's it's something I took when I first spoke to you and I think it's a fantastic framework for all FPNA individuals to use and I love that action is the foundational key to success and thinking through are we getting action with our you know with our analysis and are we getting it to that point so Deepak thank you very much I'm now going to ask the audience for some participation I'm going to launch our first poll of the day Okay, so the poll is, which of the following tools do you predominantly use for your current FP&A visualization and storytelling process? A, Excel, B, PowerPoint, C, PowerPoint add-in tools, ThinkCell, etc., D, BI tools, or E, all of the above. And thank you for voting. I'm going to let you vote for the next few seconds. Perfect. Thank you. Please continue to vote. Love your input on this. Excellent. And I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to share the results. Okay, fantastic. So Deepak, I'm going to ask you for a comment on, on this poll, please. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think not surprised. <clears throat> I would think PowerPoint, uh, you know, even for myself is something that uh, I think is predominantly used uh, in terms of telling your story um, and, you know, and followed very closely by Excel. Uh, I, I think what I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of is, is certainly number C, um, because there are certainly some great tools there like ThinkCell that help enable uh, better visualization of data. And then obviously, I think going forward, as more organizations start to get involved in BI tools, I think you'll see a lot more of that going forward as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Deepak, for that. And uh, really appreciate all the participation uh, as we went through that. So uh, we're, we're next going to go to... A quick discussion. I'm going to invite uh, Jurgen and Taylor to join me on screen, please. Okay, fantastic. Welcome, gentlemen. And so the question I have, I love Deepak's framework, the what, so what, and now what. And I would love your professional opinions on how much time should we spend on each of these three steps. And Jurgen, I'm going to ask you first, please. Well, actually, um, you ask for the should. And if you ask for the should, then I think the answer is clear. We should spend much time on the so what and the now what, and hopefully the what is supported by technology. But the reality is different. Today we spend probably 80 or 90% of the work of the analysts for analyzing the what, and this is one of the biggest problems we have. Fantastic, thank you, Jürgen. Taylor, what about you? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I, I think the, the other aspect is, um, the value is extracted out of the now what, but the way to get there most efficiently is to spend a lot of time on the what, because to the Deepak's point, there's a lot of data coming at you. If you don't spend enough time on the what, you try to skip to the now what, you potentially risk going to the wrong conclusion. So if I were to think about it like pie chart wise, you would actually say that what and now what have almost equal parts and the so what kind of just magically forms in between the two. Yeah, no, no, really appreciate that. And, you know, even tying back to Jurgen's comments of what's in practice versus what actually should be the case is, is there's a gap there, right? And and for me, what's aspirational is us as FP, as an FP&A community, we start edging ourselves more to the now what, right? And, and again, I love Tyler, Taylor's comment, Rand. Look, we need to understand the what, otherwise we're not going to get to the, you know, the right 
now what? So really, really appreciate the discussion. Deepak, thanks once again. Fantastic framework that we can all use. The what, the so what, the now what. And now we're going to move on to demystifying dashboards. So Jurgen, really excited about this. Deepak Taylor, I'll ask you to join me in a minute. But Jurgen, the floor is yours, and I'm really looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ron. Demystifying. I love that. Uh, this is exactly what it is about. So first of all, um, when I talk about dashboards, I could have two different topics. One of those topics um, I have covered in um, a webinar for FP&A Trends, let's say, two years ago. Uh, and I've been talking about notation rules for effective dashboard implementation. And the notation rules, which is about the data visualization, is also important for, um, let's say, uh, the, 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 the storytelling part. So the, the, the visualization, let's say, in PowerPoint. But I will not cover this topic today. So if you are interested in that one, please, uh, you see here on this slide a link to uh, my previous um, uh, talk in, in, in the webinar two years ago. So please go there. Today, my contribution to the winning formula um, for FPNA storytelling is different. Today, I want to demystify dashboards. The problem is that the software industry tells us that their dashboards tell stories. And I don't believe that. Let's have a closer look at a dashboard, just a typical dashboard um, that we might have here, a sales dashboard. Huh? Does this sales dashboard tell a story? Well, not sure. We can have a closer look at it. And we probably see in the middle, uh, if we zoom into that sales and make it a little bigger, then we see, oh, OK, sales increased by 82 point nine percent okay this might be the starting point of a story and we do some some further analysis have a closer look on the left hand side we see a time series with the sales if we go into that we first are a little surprised because we think oh my god in almost any month we have a drop in sales so let's let's look at june if in june um, we, we have a big drop, how can we have this increase? But then we realize, oh, they probably <laughs> have a different uh, sequence of the columns. So actually the previous year is behind the actual year. So in fact, we have a big increase in June. So our story probably so far is, yes, we have an increase in sales and maybe the biggest increase has been in June. But is that interesting? So let's look at a Gartner quote, and I would probably even contradict this Gartner quote. What they say is, by 2025, data stories will be the most widespread way of consuming analytics, and 75% of the stories will be automatically generated using augmented analytics techniques. I would agree with the first part of that quote but I completely disagree with the second part. I don't see that 75% of the stories will be automatically generated, at least not if a story is what Deepak just defined in, in, in the previous lecture. If a story is about emotion, if a story is about suggestions, if a story is about explanations, I don't see how that should work in a dashboard. And let me have a closer look at that. Just, just look at the process of, let's say, um, uh, making decisions, the decision-making process based on data. This process typically starts in IT, where we then provide the data and develop the systems. And what we get out of this is what we call a dashboard. A dashboard is just, let's say, the, the glasses that you have on data. Huh? And dashboards support the analysis. So the, the analyst does analyze that dashboard and probably should create a story. But the problem is the story does not add, end with the detection. So if you probably detect, oh, we have 25% less sales in Spain. So we have a problem in Spain with sales then your story is not that you have 25% less sales in Spain. I've been working as a C-level manager for many, many years. And I tell you, managers 
do not only want to hear the facts, they want to have more background. So they, they, they need some context, they need some explanations. What happens there? So you do some further analysis and probably you then find out, oh, yes, it's it's maybe the region around Barcelona and, and, and you don't sell red trousers anymore in Barcelona. But this still is a detection. This is not the why. The why is, why don't you sell red trousers in Barcelona? And in order to figure that out, you probably have to call that guy. Huh? So you need other sources, like shown here, other sources, conversations, external data, all that stuff that you probably won't find in your own data. The problem is that your data warehouse does not cover all the context you need in order to, to, to give the explanations and in order to find the stories. So if we look at storytelling, like, let's say, internal journalism i think that analysts are like journalists they 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 find out that there is something going on then they really do some further research they are looking for explanations they probably even make some suggestions as deepak said so we concentrate our story on the so what and the now what and i don't see how this is supported by dashboards so far because they just don't have the data they don't have the emotion they don't have the creativity to see the impact on our business and i don't see the creativity for making suggestions but we need those stories for management and this is the next step to make their decisions they evaluate the messages and then finally make the decisions so i agree manager love stories but I completely disagree that the stories, if we define the stories the way we just defined it, as Deepak defined it, and I completely agree with that, that they will be automated or created automatically by dashboards. I just don't believe that. The stories that can be automated are just low level stories, just on a fact detection level. Hey, we are 25% below plan. If this is your story, this might be automatically created. Well, hope you agree and uh, let's discuss. Perfect, thank you, Jürgen. That was uh, super insightful because there is a, a, a thought out there that, that dashboards can tell stories, but I love how you framed it up as it's a tool to help you tell stories. And some of the notes I take, you know, you talked about analysts being the journalist to be able to tell the story. And you talked about, hey, maybe low level stories may be kind of done by AI, but it's around that creativity, the data detection, the analysis, the emotion was one that we talked about, which we'll get to for sure. So really, really appreciate it. I think that's the final word on dashboards. They cannot tell the story, but they can be a super helpful asset in telling the story. Okay, I really encourage participants to send questions over. We're gonna have a Q&A se uh, session at the end. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to poll number two. Okay, so the, the poll is going to be, what is the biggest barrier to effective FP&A storytelling? Is it A, poor quality of data? Is it B, outdated technology? Is it C, inadequate skills? D, lack of time? Or E, un, an unsupportive business culture? And really appreciate the participation in poll number one. Uh, let's keep that up and I'll give you a few seconds to continue to vote. Okay, fantastic. I think we're settling in on some ranges here. We've got about 70% participation. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Fantastic. So let me share the results. And Jürgen, I'd love you to comment on, on the results. <laughs> Again, this is not a surprise. Actually, it's all of it. What, what I love uh, with this um, poll is that probably the technology plays the lowest part. And I completely agree, technology is not the problem. Um, all the others might be problems. So 
absolutely fine with the result of that poll, just see it the same way. Fantastic, thank you, Jurgen, for that. Okay, so I'm gonna invite Deepak and Taylor to join me and let's have a quick discussion on, on Jurgen's super insightful presentation. Okay, so uh, I think he's just demystified dashboards. Would love your thoughts, Deepak and Taylor. You know, how can you leverage these dashboards within your organization based on what we just heard. So Deepak, I'll start with you. For sure, so I would start with, I totally agree with Jurgen's thought process around how you would use dashboards and what it can and can't do. I think though the value of dashboards is really helps you identify the what or the dig sites, right? And that's kind of how I will look at it. I mean, we talked about, and you see it in the poll where there's clearly a lot of barriers to telling that story. One of the barriers is around time. And I do think dashboards can help you eat into some of that time, right? Gain some efficiencies there by highlighting those key dig sites, but you still need to do that investigative analysis to tell that complete story. Yeah, no, I, I really like that, right? You know, some efficiency and having a fantastic dashboard that helps you point in the direct, the, you know, the right direction first. Right. Uh, and I think that ties to that poor quality of data, right? Because if you don't have the data, then, it, you know, trying to find the what consumes most of the time. Taylor, what do you think? I couldn't agree more, and I'm actually thinking about the, the prior question about how much time to spend on the three what's. Dashboards are a tool to reduce the, the load that it takes to get to the what, to enable FP&A and others to spend more time on the so what and the what now. And so as I, as I think about it, and we're trying to deliver the right dashboards, the dashboard should be a good overview. Um, Deepak, I love the dig site idea of like, where do you look? And then spend the FP&A capacity really starting to then put together those pieces of, so what does it mean? What's the action that we should take out of this? Yeah, no, it's, I think it's a really good tie-in between the two different polls, right? And, and saying it can be a massive asset to get you there. And at the same time, sometimes I've seen dashboards where maybe there's too many dashboards, too much information, and, and it gets a little bit lost on, hey, there's too much information it can actually confuse the matter so really really important to just take a good look and say is the dashboard an asset and is it helping us get closer to the so what and now what or is it an, imp an impediment and, and i love you know just bring it back to one of Jurgen's points it does not tell the story it can be a, a fantastic asset okay fantastic taylor deepak Jurgen, amazing discussion and let's continue the fun uh, and now i'm gonna invite taylor to to go through his presentation Taylor, the floor is yours. Deepak Jurgen, I'll invite you back in a bit. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about something that I'm particularly passionate about, which is how do we persuade through story? That stories are powerful because they permeate a part of the brain, deep part of the brain, that data just cannot reach. And so we can leverage stories when we find ourselves in situations where there is a lack of alignment on not even the, the so what or the what now, but even just the what. To give you an example from my own history, I one time encountered a situation where I sent a note to a sales leader letting him know that not only were we continuing to miss on the top line, but we had started to miss on the bottom line. What I thought would just get a pretty curt, normal response of thanks, got it, actually earned me a surprise visit so that he could tell me in person to my face, I was wrong. I had to be wrong, my data must be wrong, the budget must be wrong, there was no way that this was right because he had mountains of evidence to show me that he was not only doing better than expected, but better than ever before. And this really is the crux of why FP needs to be master storytellers. Uh, there is two main friction points with our audience. First, is that they have their own facts and experiences that shape their perspective. This totally makes sense. The business can't operate solely on the financial records, even though that is the quintessential scoreboard of the business. Marketing has to look at things through the lens of cohorts. Sales has to look at it through the lens of sales capacity. We need to align perspective before we can ever move forward. But even if you have a shared perspective, the second challenge is that no one is inspired to act by logic alone. You don't reach the brain through the ears or through the eyes. There has to be some emotional pull to drive action. So to understand then how to leverage story to overcome these two challenges, let's first just dive into the challenges themselves. So to that first point that we all have our own facts and experiences, really what that means is that data is not a tool of influence, it's actually a tool of reinforcement, meaning we can all support our own perspectives with mounds of data. The critical piece is not be is just because something is true, doesn't mean that it is relevant. And that certainly played out in the situation that I opened with. 
the sales leader was looking at that gray line that you see on the bottom left, and he was totally right. They were doing better than ever before on quota attainment. I was also right that we were continuing to slide in our budget attainment, and the differential there is that this sales leader had a mix of teams that had various quotas attached to them. So what had happened was is he had started to staff teams more than we had expected that had lower quotas, such that if you're looking at percentage of attainment, that can go up, but your overall delivery would go down. The lesson here is twofold. First, we, we can't rely on data alone to set the scene because again, everyone has their own sets of data. It's like bringing everyone into a theater and not directing them to look towards the stage. Of course, everyone's gonna walk out and say, boy, that show wasn't very good because half of them weren't looking in the direction of where the action was happening. But secondarily, this highlights our role in FP&A as translators. We speak not only the language of the overarching business, but also of each individual silo. And so the way to create an aligned perspective is to start with where people are and then bring them up to where they need to be. In this instance, highlighting this disconnect for the sales leader and explaining how the staffing could actually impact this disconnect. That all being said, even if you have this shared perspective, there's still a challenge of, Logic alone does not inspire action. In Jonathan Haidt's book, The Happiness Hypothesis, he talks about this analogy of, we have two minds. There's an emotional mind, which he equates to an elephant. Big, lumbering, driven, can go through any obstacle, but also stubborn. We also have a logical mind, uh, a rider on top of the elephant who has a great vantage point, can see the entire landscape, can see where we want to go, and can plot a path to get there. But there's a size differential, and that rider can only exert so much effort upon the elephant to get there. This is a helpful framework as we think about trying to influence, because oftentimes in FPNA, we find ourselves just appealing to one or the other, but rarely both. And there's a helpful way of thinking about how you know which camp you're in. If you see what you perceive to be laziness, meaning you go in, you give your presentation, you do your what, your so what, your what now, everyone nods their heads, and you walk out and nothing happens, likely what occurred is you appealed to the writer, that's the nodding head, but there wasn't enough emotional pull to create the action needed to get to that resolution. On the other hand, if you walk away and you see a flurry of action, but no progress, Likely what you did is you created that emotional resonance. Everyone realizes that that is an objective worth chasing, but there wasn't enough clarity so that everyone is chasing the same goal. Taking it back to the example that I was talking about with the sales leader then, it wasn't enough just to lay out, hey, we have this disconnect between quota and budget, but we also then had to walk through how do we ultimately drive this? Because if you start messing with people's quotas uh, or targets or compensation, you break trust. And one of the most important things a sales leader has is the trust of his team. So we had to then devise a way to overcome this challenge by saying, all right, how do you maintain the trust, not break all the celebration you've done up until this point, but then build a bridge that says, now how do you start to close the gap to budget? This then kind of creates the framework of how do you think about story in a persuasive environment? You start with that subject, the S of story. And this is where you identify the main character and set the stage. It is never the data. To Jurgen's point, the dashboards can really kind of outline the landscape, but if you stop there, you're just gonna have a lot of friction about which data you use. And so the key point is, if you're starting to argue about data, remember you're actually arguing about the framing and you need to get to a shared perspective. Once you're there, you can start to appeal to the elephant and that emotional resonance by highlighting this tension that exists between what we want or the treasure and what's in the way or the obstacle. Depending on the audience or the source of the information, there may be multiple wants, right? It's never just, we need to hit budget. There's always some secondary factor, like with the sales leader maintaining the trust of the team. But the more you're able to address those things, the easier it is for this story to resonate and permeate that deeper part of your brain. Think about any good story. There is that tension between these two things. Little Red Riding Hood is not memorable if there's never a big bad wolf in between her and the grandmother. But it doesn't stop there, because even when you get to the inspired action, the important thing about stories is they help us to have a framework of how to tackle the next problem. So you wanna make sure you cap off the story either in the moment or down the road with some sort of postmortem that says, did we learn the right lesson? Does it tie back to a why of why we do these things? And this will help us really tackle the next challenge. Using my example of the sales leader, 
we're always messing with commission structures. So it's helpful to understand what's the best way to do that and what works and doesn't so that the next time it comes up, it's not a terrifying endeavor. It doesn't require a lot of effort to bring the elephant and rider along. We can use these stories to frame up how we take the actions. So zooming out and looking at the entire equation then for a persuasive story, start by contextualizing your data, get it to a shared perspective, which would be your information or your subject. Analyze it and come up with what are the want or wants of the audience and what is in the way? How do we get to where we, from where we are to where we wanna go? And once you've inspired that action, make sure you cap it off with some kind of postmortem so that we learn the right lesson and ultimately take it with us so that the next action is a little bit easier to take on. And that ultimately is my equation for a persuasive story and appreciate everyone's time. Fantastic. Thank you, Taylor. I, I love uh, that whole approach, right? You talked about, hey, it's not logic alone. It's logic plus emotion. You talked about being a translator, a narrator. Uh, I love the visual of the elephant, right? Like how do you get that elephant and the writer to work in sync together? Uh, and then you also talked about building trust with your stakeholders and, and tying it back to the why. Right. And a lot of times we lose that. What is the why? What are we trying to do? And absolutely love the framework. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to invite Deepak and Jurgen to join me for a quick discussion. OK, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, and, you know, again, I, I've been in many FPA, many finance organizations, and logic is usually the way to go. Right. And so I love Taylor's provocation of, hey, well, how do you combine logic and emotion? Uh, and I'd love to say, how do we start employing that dual approach more? So, Deepak, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Jurgen. Yeah, no, I, I think, look, I think what Taylor said was spot on. I think if you can combine both the logic and the emotion, I think you really have that winning formula. I would say the, the the emotional part is probably the toughest thing for FPNA professionals to, uh, to 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 manage and deal with. So that's always something that I think all of us, myself included, need to kind of build that capability. Um, for me, where I try to do that or try to build that in is is part of that. So what, right? In my context, because that's where I talk about making it real for your business partner, right? And and how do you create that emotional connection, you know, to what you're trying to drive as part of your story? And so for me, I like to leverage that. So what, uh, in terms of making it real to my business partners, uh, to try to drive a bit of that emotional connection. Fantastic, Jurgen. What about you? Well, actually, I don't like the term emotion too much. I think um, as an FPNA person, I would rather talk about passion. And if we replace emotion by passion, it's much easier for us as financials because we, we are just convinced about the things. And if we then uh, just, just tell the story with passion, we are convinced in what we are doing. I think this is already much there, uh, enough. There is no need for, for creating lots of other emotions around that. Passion would, would suffice. Yeah, no, and, and as you said that, I think it, it really convinced me as well, because I think emotion kind of conjures up the image of, you know, getting into arguments and battles and things like that, but it's more around bringing the passion and, uh, you know, even as Deepak was speaking in his hands where he's using it, I could see that passion come through. So I think that's a nice add to it, which is, is logic plus passion, and hopefully Taylor's okay with that on the fly change, but I, I absolutely love that. Okay, fantastic. So let's keep going. And what I'm going to ask each of you is I'm just going to ask you for, you know, a 30 second key takeaways. You know, we had Deepak's fantastic, the what, the so what, the now what. You're going to demystify, you know, dashboards uh, and Taylor, we're going to use passion and logic, which is fantastic. So uh, Deepak, I'll ask you first, what's your 30 second takeaway? I, I, you know, for, for me, I think it's all around, uh, you know, keeping it simple. Right. So, you know, understanding your details, understanding the business, but really keeping it simple in terms of how you want to frame up your story. Right. Uh, I love leveraging what Jurgen said around how to use dashboards more effectively. It drives some efficiencies, but it's not the storytelling. And then obviously what Taylor said, bring in that a passion and that emotion, or I say more passion, less emotion to help kind of tie it all together and really drive that that cross collaboration uh, that you're looking for. Yeah, and I, I really like that because we didn't we didn't hit on that too much around keeping it simple because sometimes we get trapped into too much data and too much information, and that is not a great story. So I love that thought of, hey, let's keep it simple. Less is more is a powerful lesson as well in storytelling, right? It doesn't have to be a 60-page deck. How do you keep it short and sweet but still hit the facts and get to the so what and the now what? All right, Jurgen, what about you? 
Well, um, what I love um, about this session is that three guys with different backgrounds and, and probably me more from a more technical background, but still FPNA and you guys from, from business, that we all agree that storytelling is something different than just looking at data. So if we just um, get this formula that yes, a dashboard and yes, data, uh, the, 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 the data analysis is an important part for saving the time uh, in order to spend the saved time on the story. I think this is uh, exactly what the, 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 the webinar has been about today. Yeah, no, I really like that. You know, different takes, but kind of getting to the same. How do we drive action? How do we drive common understanding within our businesses? Fantastic. Taylor, uh, last word on this to you. Yeah, I think my reflection on this is that we operate under two primary constraints. The one is time. There's only so much time in the day. Um, and so using the framework of the three what's help us to kind of organize and more importantly, strategize around how do you create more time for yourself in the latter two buckets by finding efficiency in the former. I think that's a really good connection point between Jurgen and Deepak's presentation. The, the secondary is actually from the, the, the poll where it said inadequate data is an, a hindrance to our storytelling. And, and I think what I would argue and what I've learned from all of this is if it's enough to get directionally right, you're able to move faster if you can focus on what do we know versus focusing on what we don't know. And so while we oftentimes lament how much, you know, the state of the data that it's in, and we should absolutely constantly be improving it, the data will never be perfect. That's why dashboards can never tell stories. So we need to figure out what is good enough and then how do we build around those things? And that's where storytelling really comes into play. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a wonderful point to round, you know, don't, don't expect to be perfect, right? Business moves way too fast. And so having that ability to be confident and trust your gut and develop your gut uh, is really powerful. So really, really love that. Okay, we're going to go into some Q&A and really appreciate the questions submitted. Uh, and the first question I'm actually going to ask Jurgen. So it's a combination of two questions, Jurgen. So the first one is, do you think that AI would provide the story to be told in the future? You've, you've touched on that already. And the second one is tied to it. How will AI and machine learning impact our storytelling? So I'd love you to just kind of your take, you've, you've touched on it, but I'd love you to go a little deeper on that. Yes, so uh, I would actually agree that AI has a deep impact on what we are doing. I actually think that AI will probably replace the way we consume the data. So dashboards will probably be some somehow replaced by you as as an fpna guy you just ask natural language questions to a system and you get automatically created reports with some data on that so i i would absolutely agree that this is the future um, and uh, and uh, that ai will help us in that respect the only thing is I wouldn't call it a story. It's just the consumption of the data, of the information of the what is different. So we don't look at dashboards anymore, but we get it presented by probably even some bots helping. We probably do not even have to do some research, but a bot is doing the statistics and finding out here and there, and then gives me a hint, hey, Jürgen, you should look at this and you should look at that, and this is happening and that is happening. So yes, this will happen. But this is not the 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 the, the so what and not the what now what no explanation no emotion no passion no it's just the data how we get the data fantastic and let, let me push on this a little bit more because I can't go a few hours without hearing about Chat GPT and now I'm the one bringing it up <laughs> but I'd love anyone to comment on there is some value in Chat GPT and somebody showed me you can hey tell me a story about a dog for my kids or something like that but I totally agree with what we're talking about. Do you think Chat GPT is going to enhance this conversation? Anyone want to? Yeah, yeah, Jurgen, you seem like you want to talk about that. So why don't you go ahead? Yeah, yeah, we we, we already did some some trials with Chat GPT, and honestly, yes, I think that Chat GPT will help us with that respect. Um, so this is exactly what I I said before. 
asking questions in natural language and getting a result probably not only natural language but in an automatically created report or dashboard visual all that stuff this by the way is the reason why we at ibcs think we need a a consistent notation because if a tool is creating a report then the tool needs some rules to do so and this is exactly what ibcs is about this is this set of notation rules behind so yes this will help and chat gpt will help us with that however chat gpt looks at at the internet so far so it has been fed by the internet and this won't help. So we would then need chat GPT versions that learn from our data warehouse, from our internal data warehouse. Um, but this is just a matter of technology and learning. Uh, but in principle, this should be possible. Yes. Fantastic. No, and I think it's, a, it's around the same point you made on the dashboards around using it as a tool, but that final creativity, that discussion, that you know, analysis really has to come from FPNA. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. So Deepak, I'm going to address this question to you. It's how, how could one develop the skills of storytelling? What skills are needed to become great storytellers? So I, I would say, you know, and I think one of the things you said earlier in your presentation, Ron, is probably beneficial for everyone, right? Which is, you know, find those people in your organization that are great storytellers and spend some time with them, right? I mean, what we certainly provided here today was some framework and some tools to help you with that storytelling. But the skill set that you ultimately need, right, and it all depends on the audience and the business you're in, but obviously, you know, you want to be a good communicator. You want to have emotion in terms of how you speak. Uh, you want to be fact-based, right, because trust is so critical for FP&A in terms of being able to tell that story and gaining that alignment with your with your peers, right, and cross-functionally, right? So those are just a handful of, of, of skill sets that are required. But I really think the best way is to to you know, connect yourself with those in your organization and learn from how they put their stories together, how they communicate, how they kind of command the audience, because you can really learn firsthand from some great leaders in, in all organization. Yeah, no, I really like that. And again, I'll come back to the way you're presenting with your hands and your energy and stuff like that. And I, you know, that's one thing I learned from stakeholders. And I went across Canada trying to explain the importance of profit to salespeople who frankly didn't care about profit. And I used to watch this person who usually kicked off the offsites and he'd be like, I'm gonna tell you a story with three things. One, two, three. There's so many little things I picked up from that that was really, really powerful. Okay, thank you, Deepak. So Taylor, I'm gonna start with you and we may go to the other panelists. Is there a tool, is there any tool you might recommend to not just gather data, but tell stories as well? Hmm. So, Thinking back on what we've talked about already today, I, I don't know that any tool could ever tell the story. Uh, it can help highlight the story, um, but I don't think it ever tell it. In terms of which tool, I think it depends on your data infrastructure, your, your tech stack and what works for you. But I think the really critical ones is however you're ultimately presenting it, whether it's Tableau or PowerPoint or Excel, um, and you're using add-ons like ThinkStyle or, or something else, the, the key point is that simplification principle we talked on earlier is can you declutter it so that the main points are highlighted and all of the noise is stripped out? Because thinking back to you know what I was talking about, that we're all coming in with our own perspective, you provide too broad of a perspective in your storytelling, everyone's going to latch onto a different data point and you won't be able to move forward with the story. So there's a combination of tools, but I think actually what's going to be most important is the skilling around how do you leverage things like color, decluttering the visual, et cetera, to really make things pop and make those visuals help highlight the aspects of your story that are important. Yeah, no, I really like that around, you know, creating that white space, that simplicity, you know, Deepak mentioned one message per slide is, is really, really powerful. Uh, Jurgen, Deepak, any comments on that from a tools perspective? I would even go one step further. I think we we just rely too much on tools and we forget about the people. So if you look at a good person that is telling just a story with passion, you probably do not need any tool. You just need that person standing in front of you and telling that story. And if that person does that good in a convincing way, then you probably do not need any tool. So um, this is an extrema, I know, but but I think uh, 
tools are just support for our story, nothing else. Yeah, no, yeah. there's a thing. Sorry, go ahead, Deepak. Well, I was just going to add on to Dragon. I, I fully agree with that because I would say one of my concerns, if we just rely 100% on the tools, we become mechanical in our roles, right? And we start to lose a little bit of our own thought and our own analytical process. And that's where I, you know, agree 100% with both what Taylor and Jurgen saying. I mean, it is it is a tool, it's a starting point. It's not it's not the end all. Yeah, no, I, re I really like that. And and I reflect back to my beginning of my career and I didn't have a ton of passion energy when I was doing those presentations and it didn't land as well. So any advice for our amazing uh, registrants and guests in terms of developing that passion? I'd love any comments on how do you develop the passion? I think for me, it, it starts with you got to love what you're doing, all right? And 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 when you when you start to formulate your financial story, um, you have to really believe in that story, right? So you got to believe that it's the right insights, it's the right actions that you want to take the organization down. And if you if you truly believe that, and your passion will come out naturally. Excellent. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the other thing to remember is businesses are ultimately people. So the more you can interact with the folks that you would ultimately be presenting to or presenting about, the easier it is to find passion. It's hard to have passion about your or your sales growth. But it's a lot easier to have passion about the effort it took to get there or the things that got in the way. And, and so the, the closer you can be to the business, the easier it is to tell the stories. If you never get behind or get from, away from the spreadsheets, it'll be almost impossible to bring passion to it because you're basically going to be yelling about statistics. <laughs> yeah, no, I really like that. And I think it, it's, a, it's a great skill set in terms of listening first and really trying to understand the business and going out to your stakeholders and going out on the road and understanding your products and stores if they are. Uh, and as you get more and more familiar with your business, your product, your stakeholders, and as you said, we're all human, listening, listening first, and then you'll get an audience that's captive. Okay, fantastic. I love all that discussion. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, and there's going to be a white paper, as I mentioned, that is going to be sent out. Uh, I love this quote. Storytelling has always been the cornerstone of the FPNA function, and its importance continues to grow. So I really hope you got these amazing formulas from these three amazing panelists. Uh, and just want to share a couple webinars that are coming up. So the first one is on May 4th, the key fp &A challenges and how to address them. And on May 10th is digital fp &A deploying AI ML for planning, budgeting, and forecasting. I think it really ties in nicely to this webinar. Uh, love the survey results, right? So we really right, like to get input and feedback into these uh, particular webinars. I absolutely love the discussions between our panelists today. So let us know what you want and we'll really try and take these really, really seriously and continue to try and improve the webinars. Thank you once again to our sponsor, ThinkSell. Really, really powerful to have this opportunity to do a global webinar with 473 registrants, 54 countries. Really, really amazing. Here's the FPNA Trends community, and I'll reiterate, I continue to be impressed with Larissa, Mariana, and the rest of the team to really try and advance the conversation, right? So they can be found on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Twitter, wherever you get your social media. And, and last but not least, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining and taking this time. Again, we'd love the feedback. The recording and the presentation will be provided, and I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Jurgen. Deepak, really, really appreciate all your time and expertise. Okay, take care, everybody. Have a great day.